Hello everybody, so this chapter I thought was pretty average. When I first read it, I didn't think much of it. I thought it was a, you know, solid introduction chapter to a new arc. But then I reread it and some of the dialogue started standing out more and more. To the point where I'm actually considering something that I had never ever considered before. Which is that Oda might be setting us up to lose a straw hat temporarily in this arc. I'll get back to that in a little bit though. Let's start with the cover first. All right, so we find that the buildings and the people of Chocolate Town have been frozen in the cover page. And this is basically like a time jump continuation of the cover page that we got for chapter 1046. Cause there we got to see the silhouette of the feet of two individuals arriving at the town and people were running away from them. And so by showing us this frozen town, Oda is pretty much confirming that those two individuals must have been members of the Black Beard Pirates, because we know that the only person capable of freezing a town like this is Kuzan, Aokiji, and we know from the Gorosei that Aokiji affiliated himself with Blackbeard. And so it seems like either Aokiji and one member of the Blackbeard Pirates or Aokiji and two members of the Blackbeard Pirates are now inside of Big Mom's territory. And the thing about Kuzan being there with Big Mom gone is that there's nobody there that can stop him, right? So Kuzan could just walk in there and do whatever he wants. Like power-wise, Katakuri would be the strongest character there to try and defend the territory. But right now him and Oven are hallucinating and they're confused, fighting each other because of Caesar's gas. Not only that, but it's been pretty well established that the first three admirals can use Rio, which is a step above the basic armament hockey that Katakuri can use. And then we've also gotten hints of some of the admirals being able to use Future Sight as well. Best case scenario here would be for Katakuri to snap out of the hallucination and then team up with some of his siblings to try and stall Aokiji. Now I think the obvious suspicion here is that the Blackbeard Pirates are after Big Mom's Poneglyphs, which are in Hokkaik Island in Whole Cake Chateau. So if Aokiji freezes the water, they can just, you know, make their way over to Whole Cake Island, which by the way, the Vinsmokes and Caesar were just leaving Whole Cake Island. So I don't know if they're gonna run into each other on their way there. Another idea here is that since Pudding is the minister of Cacao Island and she lives in Chocolate Town, then maybe the Blackbeard Pirates are also after her because of her three-eyed heritage, right? She has the three eyes. And if she awakens that power, her third eye power, she can read the Poneglyphs. She can understand the Poneglyphs. So maybe that's why they're attacking Chocolate Town first to get Pudding and then use her to understand the Poneglyphs that are in the castle. Then again, it's not like anybody believes that Kuzan is 100% on Blackbeard's side to begin with. I mean, Burgess said in Dressrosa that he just doesn't trust him. So it would just make more sense for Kuzan to actually be pretending to be an ally to Blackbeard while secretly being an undercover agent for S.W.O.R.D. So I feel like him using his powers to help Blackbeard get Big Mom's Road Poneglyph is a way for him to gain his trust. And like I said before, maybe Kuzan can use this status within the Blackbeard Pirates to help Kobe out if in fact he did get kidnapped. Because last chapter it was mentioned that the members of S.W.O.R.D. had no contact with Drake. So maybe that's intentional. Maybe Drake and Kuzan are in contact with each other and they have a plan to rescue Kobe. And maybe the plan requires Kuzan to continue to be undercover within the Blackbeard Pirates. And so now the Egghead arc has barely just started and we can obviously already tell that this is going to be a very important arc for one Straw Hat in particular. To the point where I'm not even sure if he's going to be leaving Egghead with the rest of the Straw Hats by the end of the arc. Or at least not leaving in the normal sense of being aboard the Sunny. Because there's a bunch of hints and comments made about stuff that would potentially tempt Frankie to stay behind in this island temporarily to work on stuff with Vegapunk. Okay, so the first thing that stands out is Usopp's comment about Vegapunk's robot being bigger than General Frankie. So to me, that's an upgrade waiting to happen. It's an upgrade that is looming within the storage of foreshadowing of Oda's mind. Now, if you look at the size comparison between that robot and the Sunny, it's pretty obvious that if Frankie were to make a bigger General Frankie, it probably would not fit aboard the Sunny. We get to see a bunch of weaponized sea beasts, which really remind me of the sea beasts that we saw back in Fishman Island. And Frankie is the only straw hat who is genuinely amazed at the sight of them. Another thing that really stands out in regards to Frankie's character is the meal that gets produced by the cooking machine, which is a burger, some fries, and some cola. And so we know from an SBS that Frankie's favorite food are hamburgers, french fries, and food that complements cola. Now, despite the efficiency of the machine, Atlas complains that the machine cannot be mass produced due to a lack of competent engineers. And so I started thinking like, wow, if only there was a competent engineer who had just arrived 
arrived on the island that could help you with that. And by the way, I don't know if it's just a coincidence, but out of the two Vegapunks that we've seen, one being Lilith and the other one being Atlas, I find it interesting that they both seem to have features that connect them to Uta, because Lilith kind of has Uta's face, and then Atlas has the double-colored hair split down the middle. Then again, I also think that Atlas is sort of like a homage or a reference to Astro Boy, which was an incredibly famous manga about an android that came out during the 50s and 60s, and it takes place in a futuristic world as well. So I'm sure Oda must be a fan of Astro Boy. But then also, if you look at Atlas's ears and tail, she kind of looks like she could also be a sheep Zoan, currently in hybrid form as well. But anyway, going back to the food machine, if in fact it turns out that Luffy's secret dream is that he wants to, you know, have a giant party with the world, that he wants to share food with the world, because remember, that's what Luffy told Kaido, that he wants to build a world where his friends can eat as much as they want. So if a requirement for Luffy's dream is to be able to feed a bunch of people, then this is a perfect opportunity for Frankie to step in and say, I can help you achieve this dream by mass producing these machines. However, I'm going to probably have to stay behind an egghead a little longer. Also, one of the topics that gets brought up every once in a while in the fandom is who of the Straw Hats will get hockey? Who will be the next Straw Hat to get hockey? So I feel like if Oda intended for Frankie to get armament, which to me is the one that makes the most sense that he would get, it probably would have already happened. It probably would have happened during his fight against Sasaki. And we know that that didn't happen. And the way that he defeated Sasaki was using a light beam. So I feel like if Oda wants to give Frankie a power up, it kind of has to match the character's theme. And so what do we get introduced to in this chapter? A pair of photon gloves that you can use to touch and damage light. So theoretically speaking, you could use these bad boys to hurt Kizaru, which by the way, I would not be surprised if we get to see Kizaru very, very soon. Because there's a bunch of factors that connect Kizaru to this arc. For one, we know that the laser beams used by the Pacifista and even now the Seraphims are a replica of Kizaru's double fruit power. And the whole thing about there being holograms and the use of photonic gloves means that Vegapunk has experimented a lot with the Pika Pika no Mi, or even with Kizaru himself. Again, we also know that Sentomaru was introduced as Vegapunk's bodyguard, and we know that Sentomaru, back in the pre-time skip, was a subordinate of Kizaru as well. Sentomaru also calls Kizaru uncle, although that might just be, like, out of respect, due to a cultural Japanese honorific. And then also, if you notice, the way the light is depicted around the shape of the hologram girl is very similar to the way that it's shown with Kizaru as well. Also, one of Frankie's classic techniques is, of course, the Frankie iron boxing. So you could just imagine him being able to put on these photonic gloves and being able to switch it up and say like Frankie light boxing and just start punching the seraphim beams or something. Atlas also mentions the philosophical debate about what makes something real or not. So I found that interesting because like what if Frankie could find a way of projecting himself onto the sunny? But then also Vegapunk's use of satellites slash vessels for himself in this chapter got me to think like what if Frankie does the same thing Vegapunk does but he does it with the sunny, with the ship? Like we already have that alternate timeline picture that Oda drew about Frankie turning himself into a ship and so I'm wondering if Frankie's bounty post being a picture of the Sunny is supposed to be taken as foreshadowing to the fact that he will eventually fuse himself with the ship itself, or that he's going to be taking a page out of Vegapunk's book and use the ship as a remote vessel for himself. I love how in the scene where the Straw Hats encounter Lilith, Zoro and Robin are up to bat, because if you look at the power hierarchy within the crew, the normal ranking would technically go like this, but since Luffy's gone, it's up to Zoro. But then because Sanji's busy drooling over Lilith and he's pretty much useless when it comes to fighting women anyway, you have to keep keep going down the list and so after Sanji comes Jimbei but he's gone too and so after Jimbei would come Frankie but Frankie's too busy fanboying over the robots so you have to keep going down the list to Robin and it's funny too because this hierarchy or this dynamic isn't something that's talked about openly it's just something that's understood within the crew. One of the best theories I read about what it is that Zoro could want to ask Vegapunk about is that maybe he wants to see if there's a cure for the smiley condition. Kazoro met Toko in Wano, and by the end of the arc, Toko still wasn't cured of the side effects. Because Vegapunk was able to create the first successful artificial double fruit, right? Which is the one that Momonosuke has. So if there was a character out there that would be able to undo the side effects of some unsuccessful double fruits, 
it would definitely be Vegapunk. And it's also kind of connected to what we saw with Mocha in the previous chapter, where the kids from Punk Hazard were taken to Vegapunk to undo their failed giantification. Speaking of which, Luffy makes a comment about Atlas's size in comparison to Kaido, because Atlas is pretty big. So now I'm guessing or I'm thinking that Atlas could actually be a successful giantification experiment. So if the theory about Zoro is in fact correct, and he really does want to ask Vegapunk about a cure for the Smileys, then this is ultimately going to lead us to finding out more about the origins of Double Fruits. Now the struggle that we get introduced to in this chapter about Vegapunk having these brilliant ideas ahead of his time, but not being able to complete the ideas due to a lack of funding and a lack of technological advancement is not new. This is something that we learned back in Baltimore with Frankie. Back then we learned that Vegapunk had tried to create an island heating system, but he couldn't complete it because of a lack of funding. And so that links Frankie to the theme of inherited will. During Fishman Island, Frankie mentions that during the two years, he worked really, really hard keeping Vegapunk in mind as a role model who he hasn't met yet. And he kind of alludes to taking Vegapunk's will upon himself to be able to help him fulfill some of his dreams, some of his ideas. Speaking of which, in the SBS for volume 101, where Oda actually draws Frankie older and in the normal timeline where he's 50 years old where he looks like this if you notice in that picture it's actually snowing around him which kind of means that he's in a winter island uh, so Frankie is 36 right now right he's 36 years old in that picture he's 50 years old and what he says when he's 50 years old is I'm just going to read you the translation he says it's cold I'll turn on the island heating system, which is obviously a reference to the AC system or the aircon system that is mentioned by Atlas in this chapter and how they can use it to regulate the weather, to control the weather and manipulate the temperature around them, right? So again, this is another hint that Frankie might end up staying an egghead, maybe not this arc, but he might be there like by the end of the series. And so after I read this chapter again, I started making these connections in my mind about how Luffy's goal is to surpass Roger. Zoro's goal is to surpass Mihawk. Usopp's goal is to surpass Yasop. And so now I'm thinking, could it be, right? Is Oda hinting at the fact that perhaps Frankie's goal is to surpass Vegapunk. And what would that mean moving forward, right? Because the whole thing with Frankie's bounty poster being a picture of the Sunny, that has to pay off at some point. And so I'm thinking like, okay, regardless of whether Frankie leaves Egghead with the Straw Hats or not, in the normal sense, right? Um, it's gonna change him. Like this arc is going to change Frankie and I also think it's gonna change the Sunny physically. Now, Bonnie reveals that she's already been to Egghead before as a kid. And so that brings up the only image that we have of Bonnie as a child, wherein which we see her devouring a bunch of food, almost as if she were on the verge of starving beforehand. And then we also get the pretty important revelation that Kuma is in fact Bonnie's father. And so I feel like this means a couple of things. Number one is Kuma must have been friends with Vegapunk from a very long time ago, because otherwise, why would he be bringing his daughter to Egghead? egghead when she was a child. Now, because Kuma is Bonnie's father, then this actually makes Bonnie a former princess, because we know that Kuma was the former king of Sorbet Kingdom. And we know that during Reverie, in order to infiltrate Marijoa, Bonnie impersonates Queen Dowager Connie from Sorbet Kingdom. So I'm assuming that this old lady that Bonnie is impersonating is actually Bonnie's real grandmother. Now, we also know that eventually Kuma joins Dragon, so he actually becomes a revolutionary. And so typically you only join the revolutionary army if you want to take down the world government, if you have a huge problem with the way the world government is running things. So I find it very interesting that Kuma was a king or had the title of king at one point, and yet his daughter was starving. It just feels like the world government must have done something to the resources of Kuma's kingdom. Maybe they were trying to manipulate or blackmail Kuma using Bonnie. Something must have happened between Kuma and the world government to the point where he just had enough and he decided to join the revolutionaries. By the way, because of this connection between Kuma and the revolutionaries, I'm assuming that Bonnie probably already knew Sabo before meeting him in Reverie, right? I did think that it was kind of annoying how Oda had Bonnie just not mention her interaction with Sabo at all. Uh, I kind of question the narrative purpose for keeping that a secret. Something that we learned from Wano the hard way is that Oda is really good at setting up mystery boxes, but sometimes it takes so long to open them up, to reveal what's inside of them, that by the time he actually gets to the reveal, the effect has been diminished, or even the payoff is just kind of like, 
meh. But I guess in this case, if Bonnie had spilled the beans about Sabo, it would have probably like ruined the mood or it probably would have interfered with the adventure sort of feel to this chapter. You know, Luffy stuffing his face. So I get that. I get that. But at the same time, I feel like it's pretty important stuff because like if she met Sabo, right, if she interacted with Sabo, then that means that she probably doesn't just know about what happened with Sabo. She knows what happened with Vivi as well. So number one, I did question, like, why does this information have to be kept from the reader and Luffy? And number two, if this information is going to continue to be kept secret from the reader and Luffy for a couple of chapters, then why does it have to be teased via Bonnie? Like, why does it have to be teased in the first place? Why can't Bonnie just either say the information or not say it? A big chunk of this chapter is pretty reminiscent of the Straw Hats entering Chocolate Town for the first time. You got Luffy, Chopper, and Bonnie going crazy over the food. You got Jinbei there as a chaperone, you know, just to contrast everybody else's behavior. I like how he ends up storing Chopper's Amigasa hat instead of his kimono, because he knows that Chopper's about to go crazy getting high on sugar. And before that, he actually helps Bonnie out of the tunnel ladder as well. One of the main holograms featured in this chapter is sort of like a dragon creature, and it has the emblematic banana that the banana gators from Alabasta had. So I'm wondering what the connection could be between the banana gators and Alabasta and this hologram. There's a slight breaking of the fourth wall where Bonnie explains to Luffy that holograms are stuff that you would find in comic books and cartoons. And then right next to her, we see Luffy go Nika mode to express anger in a pretty cliche and cartoony way. Also, this chapter makes it obvious that Bonnie knows what the real Vegapunk looks like, what the real body looks like, because she just doesn't buy Atlas saying that she is Vegapunk. At one point, we see Atlas hit Luffy in the face and Luffy reacts to the punch as if he were getting either hit by hockey or sea stone. And we know from Kobe that Vegapunk should know a lot about sea stone because he's the reason for why the marine ships can go into the calm belt because he created this way of coating the bottom of the ships with sea stone to fool the sea kings. So I really hope that in addition to learning more about double fruits, Oda uses this arc to teach us more about sea stone as well. I thought it was interesting too how we still haven't gotten like a full panoramic shot of the actual island I mean, we got a silhouette, right, last chapter, but we still haven't seen the full island, which is really strange because usually when we get to a new island, we get a panoramic shot of, of what it looks like. So I'm wondering if there's a secret to the composition of the island itself that Vegapunk will reveal a little bit later on. Vegapunk's lab, or at least uh, the floor that we get to see where we meet Atlas in, is full of random stuff. Like I noticed there's like a Nintendo controller there as part of the structures. Uh, some of the architecture inside of those bubbles remind me a lot of the architecture from Dragon Ball. Not only that, but the glimpse that we get to see of Shaka in this chapter, which is Punk 1. Uh, just the helmet reminds me a lot of the great Saiyaman. We also get to see some whales there as part of an overhead aquarium, which I thought was interesting because we know that whales could potentially be linked to the nature of the One Piece. Because Roger heard the Sea King say that even the whales would be happy when the two rulers came together again in the future, aka Luffy and Shidahoshi. Now if it turns out that CP0 is actually this arc's sort of main antagonist, then that pretty much guarantees that this is kind of going to be like a pretty chill arc combat-wise but probably a pretty big arc lore-wise. Kind of like Zo in a way. Because let's be honest, like Luchi, Kaku, and Stussy, they're, they're not, you know, that big of a threat to the Straw Hats anymore. It'd be fun to see characters like Usopp, Nami, and Chopper fight them, see where they stand against them. Or another thing that could happen here is that maybe this is the arc that ends up flipping Rob Luchi and actually making him an ally. It's kind of funny because at first I noticed like a little hedgehog on the table where Stussy is. And then I realized that it was just kind of like her mask. It's also kind of implied that the Kuma Seraphim has been causing some issues due to him having at least some degree of free will. And if that's the case, I think that means Bonnie will be getting some good news in terms of the possibility of being able to get her father back, at least to some extent. Uh, because in the previous chapter, Lilith said, and I quote, why isn't it possible to control the urges of living creatures? So if Kuma was like the first Seraphim, like if the first Seraphim to exist is the Kuma model, which makes sense because Kuma is also the model for the other pacifistas. So if the Kuma Seraphim is the first Seraphim that Vegapunk created, it makes perfect sense why he would be glitchy. 
right? Because he's the first. I even think that Vegapunk's logo that we see on Kuma could also be a connection to Frankie as well, because Frankie has the stars on his arms. And the star is also the logo of the Frankie family as well. Apparently, ZB0 is on a mission to eliminate all of Vegapunk's bodies, including the main one, which I believe Lilith calls Stella, which by the way, Stella means celestial star. And just in general, all of Vegapunk's bodies appear to have like a common theme related to either astronomy and innovation. So number one, Shaka was a king in Africa who was credited with being an innovator in terms of warfare and weapons, although some historians later sort of like debated whether he deserved the credit or not. But yeah, like that's kind of what, you know, his thing was with like innovation in terms of weaponry and warfare. Lilith is the name of an asteroid, which is in the asteroid belts between Mars and Jupiter. In astrology, Lilith is known as the dark moon or the unseen planet. Plus there's also some mythological references to the figure of Lilith as well as being the first female demon. Number three is pretty self-explanatory, Thomas Edison pretty famous inventor. If you ever went to high school, I'm pretty sure you know who Pythagoras is and what his theorem looks like. Atlas is the name of a titan that was punished by Zeus to carry the skies, but an atlas is also the name that you give to a book with a bunch of maps in it. York is the name of an astronomical society that was founded in 1972, but if you pronounce York Yoki or Yoke, it could also be a reference to a Japanese method of making scientifically sure that things don't commit human errors. And speaking of errors, there's a mistake, right, in terms of Atlas's number because she has a six on her dress. Uh, but the depiction of it with CB0 shows that she's number five. Anyway, Rob Lucci says that he suspects that the reason for why they're going to eliminate Vegapunk in the first place has to do with what happened in Lulucia. And so I, I'm thinking about like, if that was an ancient weapon, right? And, and Vegapunk knows how to uh, create another one. It still takes me back to Frankie potentially staying an egghead, at least for a while, because we know that there's enough foreshadowing in the series about Frankie being the one to build Pluton, right? But when is he going to have time to build Pluton if he's traveling with the Straw Hats? So I feel like this chapter strongly hints at the possibility of Frankie going remote for a little bit. Especially since we know that in order to get to Laugh Tale, you need to know four islands, right? You got the four islands and then you got the intersection in the middle and that's where Laugh Tale is. But what if one of those islands is Egghead? One of them is Elbaf. Maybe like Frankie and Usopp can stay there and then meet up with the Straw Hats once they get to Laugh Tale. We just really don't know anything about which four islands are the ones that lead to Laugh Tale. But anyway, yeah, initially I thought this chapter was pretty meh, you know, just a standard like intro adventure chapter. Uh, but, you know, the more I read it, the more I started noticing things and like, oh, wow, well, what, what does this bit of dialogue mean? And how, how can that like, you know, pay off in the future in this arc? So, yeah, there's more depth to it than I initially thought. Uh, thank you so much for watching, guys. Thank you so much for waiting. It was super annoying to find out that this chapter officially was going to be released on Monday. Thankfully, though, the next chapter will be released on a Sunday officially. So there's that. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for all your support. Take care. Again, thank you for waiting. Let me know your thoughts about the points that I raised in the video. I'll catch you on Sunday. Bye.